Welcome to the Aguilar Conversations, a global perspective. I'm Tony Aguilar. As millions around the world celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Pope Francis, in his Easter sermon, called for peace around the world. One of his recent announcements, however, namely Fiducia Supplicans, has caused some controversy with many bishops and cardinals within the Roman Catholic Church. Nonetheless, with another Synod on Synodality coming up in 2024, can Pope Francis steer a new path for the Church that will continue to be more inclusive? That issue, next. Joining me today is Claire John Grave, Vatican reporter at Religion News Service. Claire, thanks for joining me today. And it's great to be here. Let me start off by this. The last time you and I spoke was about the Pope's uh, Synod on Synodality. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what you feel came out of that. But a broader question that I wanted to ask you is this the Pope's um, way of combating what is some consider to be a postmodernity. In other words, when there is no universal truth, everything is relative. Is this the Pope's way of combating against that? Um, so it's hard to really say what has come out of the Synod on Synodality's first session because the Synod is an ongoing process. These are the terms that people inside the Vatican will use to try and has have us uh, greedy journalists looking for news understand what is happening. Um, so we are being told that what the Synod is doing is creating a listening chamber for the Pope to consult and understand a wider uh, spectrum of Catholics around the world and non-Catholics, people from other faiths and religions. Um, so we did get a report at the end of the first Synod session that was last October, and the report was extremely, uh, it had a very wide scope, um, talked about the role of women, it talked about the inclusion of marginalized communities, it talked about the need for priests in certain regions and the formation of priests to be changed. So huge topics, which left, I think, the Vatican uh, a little bit scrambling to understand, all right, what do we focus on <laughs> among all these different issues that have been brought up and so the latest update that we have is that the next Synod on Synodality, the second session taking place next October, will be solely focusing on a synodal church. That means that some of the issues that we have right now that are kind of the hot button issues that we've been talking a lot about, LGBTQ Catholics, uh, ordination of women possibly, um, how to reform certain aspects of the liturgy and the church, those will be put into study groups, the Pope ordered, that will be studying and observing these facts with the appropriate canonists and with the appropriate um, theological background to actually come to conclusions by 2025. Um, this means that does what, what's, what's going to happen next, next October, does that address the post postmodern world that we have right now? I think the answer is a bit complicated, and I forgive my long-winded answer, but it's a complex question. I would say yes, in the sense that the goal of this synod is to change the way in which we engage with one another. And it sounds very lofty and distant and complex, but in fact, it's really crucial to what is happening right now. When we think about the concepts of truth, my truth, universal truths, objective truths, and how we relate to them, Pope Francis thinks that the space for that is in dialogue, it's an encounter. And the, the prism through which this happens in the Catholic faith is through the Holy Spirit, it's through faith in God. And so by creating that basin of unity that doesn't need to be too constrictive, doesn't need to be taking people out, pushing them one side or another, the Pope hopes to create a process that can engage in this world in a way that is credible. One of the issues that has come up as a result of this was his announcement in terms of the uh, Producia Supplicans, 
which talks about blessings, and some have talked about this in only one lens, the blessing of same-sex unions, which my reading of it, it, it does not do that. But could you say a little bit more, because that has caused some controversy, particularly here in the United States with some of the uh, more conservative bishops, but also with uh, cardinals and bishops in Africa. So say more about that in terms of what this actually says and what it does not say. All right. Well, the document, Fiducia Supplicans, is an example of when the Pope takes something in his own, hand, in his own hands and addresses it. Um, we know the German church has been doing this for a while, and he is, he is saying this is okay. But these are the conditions that we're going to create for the blessing of same-sex couples. Now, the way that the Vatican and the Pope will describe it is that the union is being is not being blessed, but it's the individuals in the union. And by the way, this also includes a lot of other reg people in irregular situations. That includes the majority of Catholics who might be divorced and remarried. That's a much larger number of people compared to perhaps LGBTQ Catholics who might you know, be not so close to the faith for reasons that we can imagine. So this is, yes, I reach towards LGBTQ people, uh, faithful, but it is also for a whole other group of people. Now, of course, the Pope has to speak to 1.3 billion Catholics in the world. Um, these have very different opinions and positions. And also it's an ecumenical church that tries to engage with other religions and other uh, Christian denominations uh, who might not hold the same beliefs uh, that, that the Catholic church has on these issues. So of course there is tension. And and some of that tension comes from conservative beliefs that the church should not open the door towards this at all. But if you really look at all the restrictions that are being placed there, um, it actually it creates a very clear uh, set of principles for which this can in no way really be compared to a marriage. And maybe for conservatives who oppose this, they, this should be consoling if that's their biggest worry. Um, so... <laughs> It's um it's a way of Pope Francis of addressing an issue that is very big in the Catholic Church today, but doing it in a way that he hopes will respect the Catholic faith as a whole. Isn't this way, isn't this a way of Pope Francis, who throughout his life, you know, as a Jesuit, has always thought of the church as being inclusive and trying to figure out ways of not saying you can't come in but trying to figure out a way of saying you are invited in because, you know, we, we all grow up with this sense of God loves the sinner, but not the sin. So we've gone up with that concept. So isn't this a way of the Pope really carrying out that belief that I don't have to accept the sin, but I have to accept the sinner? Yes. And I would add to that, that if any Catholic who has met with uh, pastoral, you know, um, priests who accompany you in your spiritual life, they will always start by including you, even no matter how sinful you are, a good pastor is going to bring you in and then bring out, you know, this is what the Catholic Church teaches against this and this and this. And only do that once there is a basis of acceptance, of welcoming, of love in the church, and of course, of faith. And the Pope is very much, he's, we would call him pastoral, right? He is close to people's real needs. And perhaps the best way to bring people in the church, by the way, a church that is losing faithful in Europe, uh, that is, the, its views are empty, its donations are dwindling. The way to bring people into the faith is perhaps not to bring out the stick, but to just present a vision of the church that isn't so hostile and just a set of rules that are against the way that you, the way you live. So... Let me continue with that point for a minute. Is how much of this, in terms of the folks who are against the announcement that came out, is rooted solely in theology and traditional thinking? And how much of it is rooted in power? Because part of this, you know, part of the power of a priest in any denomination is to decide who's in and who's out. So, for example, the, the notion of the Eucharist, who can receive it, who cannot. 
that is a theological issue, but it's also a power issue because if you are a very devout person, the ability not to receive, let's say, the Eucharist is deeply felt. So how do you split that? Is it solely uh, theological or is it a, a power thing as well or a combination of, of the two? Well, I, yes, you know, the opposition to this, to um, fiducia supplicants was from very different parts of the Catholic Church. And, and some are just, you know, they're holding true to the Catholic doctrine that says that homosexual acts are considered sin. And so, by the way, the previous document that the doctrine of the faith, that is, you know, the Vatican Inquisition with a new name issued, um, stated that, no, we cannot bless sin. That's why we cannot bless homosexual couples. That is the language that the church has used forever. Um, so people who still believe that that's true will hold on to that and say, wait a minute, this is this is not right. Um, then there are other people who, honestly, it's a question of culture. And, and cultures around the world are, are very different in their acceptance of, um, of, of gay couples, of, of lesbians and all different realities. And... Actually, what the church in Africa said was, wait, 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 <laughs> we need some time to figure out how to make this possible in our church. We need to start a process to help our church and our faithful understand what this is, because otherwise we will create confusion. And that's not what we want. And, and then there's what you talk about. Then there's power. And, and I would say that is definitely visible in certain factions of the church that are thinking about the next conclave. They're thinking about um, how to negotiate favor in the church in order to bring the church in a direction that they see fit. Uh, people who perhaps don't act out of faith, but out of what Pope Francis has often called clericalism, which is the belief that people who have a collar and are priests are somehow better than others. And he believes this to be the biggest scourge in the Catholic Church. Um, so, yes, absolutely. These these all these different factors are playing a part in this. Another issue that has come up, obviously, is the issue of women within the church in terms of um, positions of authority. And I wanted to touch on an article you wrote, uh, I believe, last week. Uh, the, the topic of the article was, can you be a feminist and a Catholic when you were interviewing uh, Julia uh, Rubio, Julie Rubio? And say more about that, because... As you stated, women are leaving the church, the Catholic Church. Um, I don't know what the figure is in terms of how many, but it's a lot. So how does she talk on that? And how do you see women in the church and responding now to, let's say, women being in the diaconate? And there's a question of whether ordained or not ordained. And that's another issue that is definitely going to come up. How do you read that? And how do you think the Pope is going to react to that? down the line uh, so this is a big topic that i am constantly since i've started this job i keep addressing and trying to understand you know the article i wrote with julie she's a fantastic theologian she wrote this very interesting book and she has these this view that being a catholic and a feminist today is much more difficult and this is because the catholic church has in a way stayed behind in adapting to some issues that have emerged and struggled to really find answers and solutions that are compelling for a lot of people today. But at the same time, feminism has changed and it has embraced certain views and certain issues and it has tackled some of these postmodern questions that you referred to earlier um, that the church just really is, is struggling with and, and feels completely at odds with. So she says, yes, you can be a Catholic but and a feminist, but the excuses that perhaps the first feminist Catholics had, which were something along the lines of, um, this is my faith, I'm staying because this church needs my voice, um, I, I want to be part of a church because I love it and I want to bring it towards the right path, feels a little bit um, harder. It, it, they don't work anymore. And um, it's the most interesting part of my conversation with her is that when we think about women in the church, really they'll say, well, there's not a lot of positions of power for women in the church. Women, for example, can't be cardinals. This means they can't choose the next pope. 
Women, of course, can't be Pope because they can't be cardinals. Women aren't even allowed to be members or participants of the C9, which is a council of cardinals that advises the popes on important decisions. Before Pope Francis, women were not allowed in synods. Um, women do not hold positions of power. So based on this, it is actually very difficult to imagine why a feminist would want to stay in the church. Now, a very important aspect is that she says, no, it's not so much in the power. It's not so much in being a, a pope or a cardinal. The real issue here is that when we attend mass, women are not allowed to have a voice and they are wasted within the church and their energy and, and focus is wasted within the church. And this is really the, the big culmination of the problem for, for Pope Francis and what is happening now within this institution. At the Synod, probably the question of women was one of the biggest questions of all. And that means that for a lot of Catholics, this is, you're right, we don't have the data, we don't know how many women are leaving, but there are a lot. <laughs> and unless the Pope figures out a decision to answer this issue somehow, um, I, I'm afraid this problem will continue. That is what I've observed. Um, you know, look at the question of LGBTQ Catholics. You know, the Pope has often said the Synod is not a democracy. The Synod is something else. And if what I've come to understand now is that the Synod is a way for the Pope to listen to the voice of the church an always larger number of people of that church who can represent it fairly. And it's it's a listening chamber for him. And so once he's heard, these are the issues, he acts. And so the question of maybe we were expecting a big document to come out of this and talking about LGBTQ faithful, no. The Pope acted on it with his dicastery and came up with a response. And I wouldn't be completely shocked if the Pope at a certain point came up with some sort of answer that is alternative to wearing a cassock because we know he doesn't want that for women. He wants something different. Um, that will allow women to feel like they are actually being valued in this institution. I mean, part, part of the question, I think, you know, as people look at the Roman Catholic Church, um, you know, I a Lutheran, and we went through, you know, there are various formations of the Lutheran Church, as you, as you well know. Um, you know, one part of the Lutheran Church does not ordain women. Um, you can't be divorced. And another part, it's the total opposite. So, my question to you would be, at what point would someone look to create, I think we have spoken about this before, in terms of creating, let's say, their own synod or their own schism, if you please? Um, you know, because I look at a congregation, you know, going back to LBGT for a minute, the German synod um, pathway, for synodal pathway, for example, which wants the Pope to be even more progressive than he has shown himself to be. So at what point do people just say, I'm done, I've had it, I can't deal with this anymore? Because it seems to me that uh, 2024 and uh, the next conference of bishops that comes up, if, it has to resolve that issue somewhere and somehow mm -hmm. in some way. So what's your take on that? Well, the fear of schism is a fear that is always present in the church. We have come uh, by a very important anniversary, which is the uh, Protestant schism, of Martin Luther. Um, so it's a it's it's a recurring reality in the life of the church. And we've asked this question to the Pope when we were on a papal flight. I don't remember coming back from where, but he just scrolled his shoulders and said, I'm not afraid of the schism. He's not. And here's here's the thing. Um, mostly, if, we, if we're thinking of progressive parts of the church, they are holding on to their faith by a thread. And it's more likely that they will just let go of that thread and say, you know what, I've tried, that's enough. That's not a schism. That just means more and more people are going to leave the church because just the church is not able to come up with the answers that a lot of people are waiting for women, LGBTQ faithful. So that's one reality. When I think of schism, I think of schism coming from the right wing, actually, of the church. Let's call it right wing, although the Pope wouldn't like these terms. But to speak in American terms, conservative factions of the church um, that don't like the direction the church is taking, don't you know think we should go back to how things were. Let's make the church kind of smaller and more intimate with 
people who have true faith and hold on to their true beliefs and let go of all this, you know, modern nonsense that is doing us no good. And I think the Pope is feels confident kind of, uh, you know, shaking it off, as one would say, because he says, you know, if th that's a, a very small portion of the Catholic Church. We've seen these kind of schisms before it happened in the Second Vatican Council. These, this was in the 60s. And also it's, you know, it, it lacks attraction. So he says, the biggest risk I can occur is that these people who already don't like me and don't like the church and they wouldn't really like any direction that the church is taking, they might, you know, go off and create their own small group. And by the way, they would go against themselves because as Catholics, they don't want to leave the real faith and the church. And I'm much more concerned with going out and getting the lost sheep. But and please, let, let me follow up on that. Going out and getting the lost sheep, but I think, and I'll just use the United States for a moment. The United States is, as you know, in its own schism, whatever terminology we want to use, but there's a lot of um, conservative folk who um, believe in some of the things, let's say like Bishop Strickland believed in, who the Pope removed from his, from the diocese. Uh, but there are a lot of people who do believe in that. So I guess I asked the question, he may not be afraid of the schism because it's a small minority, but it's a minority that could be added on to by other, by other groups, evangelicals who are very conservative and the like. So it may start off, it's a possibility of starting off small, but at least in the United States and possibly in places like Africa that are very conservative, which is, if the Catholic Church is growing anywhere, the fastest one of the fastest growing parts of the Catholic Church is in Africa. So could it uh, pretend danger for the church there, even though it may start out small? Well, you know, I, I wonder, I, I speak to a lot of conservative Catholics who are very well intentioned and uh, sometimes exceptionally informed about the history of the church and their devotion to, I don't see them as willing to separate themselves as some might think. That part that is willing to separate itself is actually very much a small vocal minority of the faithful. And if, if people were able to stay in the church when popes had mistresses and had uh, lavish parties at the Castel Sant'Angelo here in Rome, um, I think that's the kind of perspective that sometimes the Vatican and popes need to have when looking at the institution. So, yes, it's true that there might be opposition to this pontificate. Yes, it's true that the African church is growing and that it has tendency towards conservative beliefs. But they are also extremely devout and faithful to the institution and know that sometimes you need to withstand maybe a pope you don't really agree with you don't really like perhaps but their faith is kind of higher than that i'm not so convinced that if a group were to su succeed or, or separate itself from the church that it would actually create this big unity around it now if we're talking politically then maybe yes maybe in the united states there is a marriage between some conservative catholic catholic factions and evangelical factions and trump supporters and all these kinds of realities but the pope is not thinking about this political reality in one place in the united states and he's not worried that this is going to actually represent the needs and demands of faithful in the pews because they're not so worried about that and and I, I think he's a very well-informed man, and, and he knows, first of all, that his concern is, is not with these big games. And it, it might come again at the conclave. When this pope resigns or dies, these people that you just mentioned might come together and they might engage or try to um, rig the, the conclave somehow. They'll try and do little games that have always been played in the Catholic Church to elect your own candidate, which you prefer. He knows that. But he's acted also on this by creating a, a diverse number of cardinals from different parts of the world, making it very difficult for them to meet and scheme. Um, so he's um, he's not as naive, and he seems he seems somewhat unconcerned about this this possibility. Now I don't know whether he's right or not, <laughs> but but he isn't. So 
Let me move to another topic. You know, he had his Easter sermon, his Easter message, uh, which he called for peace in the various parts of the world that are undergoing tremendous uh, violence right now. But one of the things he had said previously before Easter was for Ukraine to negotiate with Russia. And that was interpreted, rightly or wrongly, as he's calling for Ukraine to surrender, which had to be cleaned up a little bit in terms of what he was asked actually saying. And I think uh, President Zelensky had some comments to make in reaction to that. But how does he see that situation right now? Because I think, as we've spoken about, he does not see Russia as this evil empire, for example. I mean, the Pope has a very interesting take on how he sees the world. And going back to what we talk about post-modernity, for example, he doesn't see democracy as the end all and be all of everything or capitalism, things of that nature. But how does he see a, a, a nation, let's say, like Russia, for example? I mean, I, and that goes to another question in terms of then how does he then define evil? Mm. Oh my gosh, these are big questions. Let's see if I can answer them. So the pastoral approach that we've talked about so far that has been so tremendously successful for the Pope um, when it comes to real lives of people that has made him very loved by marginalized groups. Well, that technique, when it comes to international geopolitics, doesn't really work very well. It fails. Um, and Vatican diplomacy efforts have to somewhat address and deal with this fact with the pontiff that will sometimes just do an interview with some random person and say things that are quite problematic from an international perspective. And so the Pope, as you said, needs to clean up that, that problem. We had this happen on several occasions. I was at a press conference with Israeli and Palestinian representatives on the same day. And, you know, some said he mentioned, he referred to the Palestinian, um, the, the Israeli occupation of Palestine as a genocide. And then the Pope had to say no. So this kind of phenomenon that you have described has happened a lot under Pope Francis, where he'll say something that needs to be redacted. Now, why does the Pope say these things? Does he believe them? Yes, he does. But they're not said in the language that international diplomacy requires. And what does the Pope believe? Well, the Pope doesn't think that the world is divided in good guys and bad guys. He's never bought that. Um, this is because he is an Argentinian and then he's Italian origin. And these are countries where the battle of the Cold War between one side of the world and the other was felt. Was felt in the politics, was felt in the election, was felt in the street. A book by the a sort of biographical pope, book by the Pope where he describes his life through historical events really highlights this. How he lived some, through some of the most important moments of history, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki from a decentralized perspective, not as a citizen of the United States, uh, not even as a citizen in Europe, but as someone from the bottom of the world, just looking up and trying to understand it. So this view of the Pope has remained. And so when he looks at these dynamics, when he sees these never ending wars, when he sees the arms trades that continues to profit on conflicts, when he sees Honestly, some of the what he's called the hypocrisy of some Western nations who are more concerned with conflicts that are closer to them physically and materially and economically than those that are further away, whether they are in, in Myanmar or in Yemen. Um, so that is what informs the Pope's perspective. He looks at Russia as someone who a, a person that he needs to enter in dialogue with. Because if that doesn't happen, he believes they were going to repeat the same mistakes and the never ending cycle of wars will continue. He appointed a person for the Ukraine conflict who believes in these things. I went to see him while he was presenting his own book um, the other day. And this is a person who says, let's get over the bad guys versus good guys mentality, because that is over. There are no good guys and no bad guys. If you look underneath the curtain, there is no such distinction. So the hardest question for me to answer, once we've created this sort of basis where, as you said, hate the sin, not the sinner, right? 
Putin might be doing some horrible things. Putin is doing horrible things. Putin has done horrible things. But that doesn't mean that Putin is not someone that you can engage with in dialogue and come to a like a fruitful peace that can be lasting. This is the basis of Pope Francis's diplomacy. This is what the Vatican has been doing consistently and no one has been listening to them, of course, because that is the reality, but it has been probably the only voice in the whole international um, chessboard that has consistently said, let's sit down and talk. And now the end game for this is that the Pope hopes that one day he will be able to sit down and talk, that he will be able to bring these forces together. His predecessor, jo John Paul II, he was the man of the Second World War. He had grown up in Poland. He had seen how horrible communism was. He was the guy who was like, we are going to bring this reality down. Now that happened, the Pope commends it, but he says, now that we've done it, now that the Berlin Wall has fallen, we need to start a process of reconciliation. And who knows about reconciliation and forgiveness more than the Christian faith? And the Pope feels like he's embodying that. And maybe that's the answer to your question about the nature of evil. You know, what? yes, there is evil, but when people do evil, and the evil and the people need to be separated. And especially when we're talking about a country with its citizens, its civilians, these are not all, all bad people. These are people like anyone else. What do you say in response to folks who would say that whether it's the Roman Catholic Church, the Protestant Church, whomever, they tend to define their situation by what is the best situation that would allow them to exist so that you know even in the lutheran church or whatever um we look at various forms of governance for example mm -hmm. and we will make deals because they give us the opportunity to exist not mm -hmm. necessarily to act out the gospel but to exist as an institution and that's been a historical um premise for for centuries that i can form an alliance with the communists or the fascists or authoritarianism not because i necessarily agree with them but because it gives me as an institution an opportunity to exist mm -hmm. is that where pope francis would be in terms of how he sees the world um I think the best way to answer this question is if we look at the situation in China. Um, Pope Francis signed a very controversial document with China that allows the Chinese government to select bishops and appoint them. This has been extremely problematic in the church. Some people think that the church should not have handed over that kind of power to China. Some people think that this agreement in a way muffles Pope Francis from being able to really call out China on its human rights offenses. Um, you could say that the Pope has adopted this view in other circumstances as well. He needs to think about the Christians and the Catholics who live in countries where certain basic rights are not guaranteed. That is also his duty. Um, according to some, maybe his primary duty. Um, and, and maybe, yes, maybe the Pope thinks that sometimes you need to shake hands with the devil in order to, um, to do some good. And, and, and I think he's not even blind to the fact that that is a big part of Vatican diplomacy. And, and I he's also willing to take on the brunt of the backlash that comes with that. And, and he knows that that's somehow part of his duty. And, you know, in the end, with these questions, it will really be history to judge the Pope. Um, we talk so much in my line of work of Pius XII, of the Second World War, of the world, role of popes during the Second World War, and where there, there were mistakes made, you know, and they were calling for peace, but then also signing deals and, and making um, some sort of accords with the different fascist or Nazi factions in order to get this or that advantage. And, and history judges you for that in the end. And, and I think the, the Pope, 
will one day, it's, it's hard now when we are in this moment to look at Pope Francis's policy on Ukraine, on the Holy Land, on South, South Sudan, uh, South Sudan, sorry, my Italian, um, or other parts of the world or China. And it will be another thing to do that 50 years from now, when we'll know what the actual cost of those decisions was. It, it does seem to me that the Pope, as with any ecclesiastical leader, always has to walk a thin line between what the doctrine is and what the realities on the ground is. And that's that can sometimes be a difficult thing to do, and sometimes it can be a painful thing to do. So many folks look at Pope Francis and they see him, they see him more to the left than to the right although they don't believe that he has left his theological roots and that he is still upholding uh, Catholic doctrine. But they also know that he is a guy that seems to be more on the side of inclusivity in trying to figure out how does that happen. But with that, I want to ask the question in the moments we have left. Uh, one of the statements he made came about as a result of surrogate mothers. And he was clearly... Uh, condemning that uh, or the practice of it. So that, how does he reconcile that? Because there are people that do that. There are people who want to have a family and simply cannot for, for various reasons. And yes, you know, one of the, the fallback reactions would be adopt. And that's certainly um, an option, but people that want to have a family. So how did he come to that conclusion uh, based on where he, where he tends to be most of the time, which is maybe center left to the right every now and then. So how did he come to that conclusion? Well, one thing that the Pope has been very consistent on since the beginning is the question that we would call just the life questions. Pope Francis has referred to abortion as hiring a hitman. Um, Pope Francis has talked about gender theory and gender ideology, especially when it impacts people's lives and sexuality as being a form of ideological colonization. Now Pope Francis has called, you know, surrogacy and and a sin, essentially. And, and he has voiced his opposition to this practice. Now, this is because the Pope, he might be progressive or, um, or conservative in lines that, if you look at him from a, an American perspective, there are some views to the right and some views that are traditional to the left. This is not the same for Pope Francis. Pope Francis is outside of this distinction because he is first and foremost, foremost a Catholic and the head of the Catholic Church. And he believes that the dignity of human life starts, oh, he's against euthanasia. He starts from conception until death. And this plays out in the question of surrogacy. He studied biology. He uh, considers himself sort of scientifically inclined. This was obvious in his documents on the environment, which ironically place him more to the left, I would guess, in the United States. But he is unequiv unequivocally against um, against any sort of 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 grayness or confusion on questions of life. So when that statement came out, it was not surprising uh, to Vatican observers, because if you really look at him, he has been consistently following this line. And uh, he also, I think, holds a series of beliefs that reflect where he comes from and who he is and um, are in line with traditional Catholic doctrine. Um, you know, the, the question of surrogacy is a complicated one. There are several think tanks at the Vatican that are opened and, and, and debating the question. Um, his comments were also made in the context of a meeting about uh, dropping natality rates uh, in Italy. So there was a lot even in that comment that is hard to uh, it, it's easy to extrapolate just that word and say, oh, the Pope is just, but he was actually making a bit of a more complex discussion about how we view the family and what does it mean to be parents 
Um, now, immediately after that statement, I interviewed people who were uh, Catholics who have, who are surrogate parents or who have taken part in this. And, you know, they were deeply and profoundly hurt. And, and, and the same thing happens for a lot of, for example, young Catholic women who uh, might be thinking about having children via surrogacy. And, and this was quite a shakeup for them. Um, and, and they said, their point of view is that they wish Pope Francis better understood their reality and met personally with surrogate, surrogate parents and children and understood that reality better. But what Pope Francis really opposes is the proliferation of embryos um, that are not, in his view, treated as they should, and in his view, are potential for life that is being wasted or discarded. It's part of what he calls the throwaway society. And uh, you can agree with it or not. But I think some time will have to pass before a Pope says anything different. With the, and staying with that just for a moment, would the inclusion of more women in positions of authority perhaps soften those views or that position? Because then you, you would have that viewpoint being made to you because it, it seems that he made that from a theological perspective, obviously. But I don't know if it was done, as you said, maybe without input from people who have gone through surrogacy. And maybe with the, the inclusion of women in more senior positions, uh, some of these positions might be softened, not totally done away with, but perhaps more nuanced. Would that be fair to say? I absolutely yes. I think that's absolutely. We see that every time Pope Francis meets someone, talks to someone, he learns, he listens. Um, but also keep in mind that popes in Italy we have a saying, you know, once a pope is dead, another one is made, and um, there is also that that you know what is the next pontificate going to be like? How are they going to view this issue? Pope Francis is now eighty-seven. And um, we don't know what's going to happen, but I think in a lot of terms and a lot of these issues that we've discussed today, he has pushed the ball as far as he can. And he's push pushing this, this to the next guy who's going to be there. And, and he hopes to have set up the church in a way to present and decide on a guy who will do the right thing. Um, but this is, this is difficult to to discern. Keeping with that for the moment we have left, for the next Pope, you know, the article came out where uh, Pope Francis did talk about how, you know, a group of folks try to use him to block the um, election of Pope Benedict. So what do you think will happen? As you said, he is 87. He has had some health issues. Um, he is not going to resign as far as we can tell. And I think he's basically said that he's not going to resign. But what do you see happening with the next pontiff that is going to be elected? Where, what direction do you think that is going to head in? So you mentioned this, this interview. Um, there is a part in it that I thought was very curious. Um, he says, I backed Benedict XVI, whom we know is a conservative, Pope, right? Very much in line with tradition. Because I felt that after this dynamic, charismatic, ever-moving pontiff like John Paul II, we needed someone who was going to kind of keep things quiet, pave the way towards reform, and sort of do that quiet building work. And then immediately afterwards, he says, see, if someone like me had been elected, and I'm a troublemaker, I would not have been able to do anything because I would have met so much resistance. And that's the kind of resistance that even Benedict met. So imagine what would I have had to deal with. Now, why is this interesting? Because it tells us a little bit about what Pope, for how Pope Francis views himself. He sees himself as a disruptor, as someone who is bringing about change. He sees himself closer to John Paul II, even though they're very different intellectually, um, than Benedict XVI. 
So maybe Pope Francis also understands that after his pontificate, there will be a need in the church for someone who is more an in-between pope, someone who will continue the process, keep the road in the direction, but not be perhaps as, as problematic, as, as a troublemaker, as Pope Francis put it. You know, someone who can sort of calm spirits a little bit. And remember, the, the Vatican takes the long view on things. They really do. Um, it's, it's a lot of bold guys really running it. So that makes sense also. Um, so um, what I have seen is that, yes, there is going to be a strong resistance to having another Pope Francis. I hear sometimes people saying, never again an Argentinian, <laughs> never again a, a progressive. There are some cardinals who are on the war path to make sure that the church is brought back to the right direction. And they will play their role. We can expect that. And another factor is that the cardinals that Pope Francis has elected, they are decentralized. They're far away from places of power. We have a cardinal in Mongolia and there are like 10 faithful over there. <laughs> so th these cardinals, and very young, I think he's 39 or something. They have never met each other. They haven't had the opportunities to create the intrigue and dy dynamics that we Vatican observers love watching and trying to decipher and understand. And I think the Pope wants it that way because what he hopes will happen, and he says this in the interview too, is that there will be no time to rig this conclave because the Holy Spirit will decide. Now, I don't know if Pope Francis's wish will come true, but his intention, I think, is to have someone who will continue the path and in a but in a quiet, more subdued manner that will allow maybe for another Pope in the future to rumble it up, to shake it up again, to shake the box. Um, and there are a few candidates that present that profile who have been able to tread this delicate line in a very polarized situation. And uh, who knows? We'll see. <laughs> We, we would, in the United States, would probably call Pope Francis uh, Italy's version of John Lewis, who always talked <laughs> about good trouble. So, right. so yeah, that's that. a good one. <laughs> My guest today has been Claire Joncove, Vatican reporter at Religion News Service. Claire, I want to thank you for joining me today. Oh, it's always great. Thank you. Join us again next week as we discuss another issue of international importance here on the Aguilar Conversations, a global perspective. The Aguilar Conversations, a global perspective, is produced by Casa Margo Communications Group.